I have a serial entrepreneur, Blake Hutchison, the CEO of Flippa, which is the leading marketplace globally to buy and sell sites, stores, and digital properties. A very warm welcome to the show, Blake. Thanks, Koshik. Thanks for having me. You spent about six years in business development across companies like Lonely Planet, BBC, and VC-backed companies. I myself have spent about 14 years in sales across B2B. In your experience, how critical is sales to building your own company? Yeah, I'd say it's critical. I don't think you can build a great organization long-term with sales centricity without a performance-orientated culture, which is about introducing your services to as many customers as possible. And as you know, Koshik, there's two growth regimes. There's product-led growth and there's sales-led growth. And I think that those two practices suit businesses at different times in their life cycle. And probably until now, I would say that Flipper has predominantly been a PLG company utilizing mostly the referral dynamics that are inbuilt within marketplaces, i.e. marketplace dynamics and network effects to, to win customers. But I think over time, we've realized that as we want to expand into new markets, as we want to win higher value customers, we need to build a, a sales and a sales system within the organization. Fantastic. So let's talk about Flipper itself. You've been going full steam for about five and a half years. So tell us a little more around it. So Flipper is the number one marketplace to buy and sell online businesses. And so what that means is that any digital asset owner around the world, be it an e-commerce business owner, someone who's built a blog, perhaps an, an iOS or, or Android app developer, a SaaS business owner, even a newsletter publisher or a YouTube channel host. So long as they have built a good quality business, which is revenue generating, Flipper as a marketplace will give them a pathway to exit. And so the best way to think about Flipper is M&A. The buying universe is a combination of institutional and company investors, and they are private equity, family offices, company buyers, as well as individuals. And of course, the, uh, the deal sizes vary greatly from sites that are selling for ten to $50,000 all the way through to site stores and apps, which is selling for in excess of $10 million. So it really is a truly price agnostic marketplace, democratizing the exit and providing opportunities to own for all sorts of buyers and entrepreneurs around the world. Very interesting. So how does the uh, valuation happen? Is it something that you also have a part to play or is it like completely depending on the business? Certainly the valuation is completely dependent on the business, but the... The way a valuation is derived is completely dependent on Flipper's proprietary data. And of course, uh, he's powering tens of thousands of transactions across the globe over many, many years. And so it's analogous and similar to real estate. We have comps and those comps can be used to provide an indicative estimate or valuation for a business based on any number of variables. Mm -hmm. So to give you an example, we have seen multiple Android apps sell, and we have seen those Android apps sell for various different price points. We can then create some assumptions about how relevant one app is to another and therefore provide a, a fairly accurate estimate. And so that will take into consideration the revenue profile of the business, the operational data, including the expense profile and, and cost profile of the business, obviously how long it's been operating for, its growth trajectory, is it growing, is it flat, is it declining? And then it will even take into consideration the metrics that matter for different business models and, and types of assets. So using the app example, um, and we'll take, take a look at daily active usage alongside the business model. So is it a subscription business model? Is it an advertising business model? And then the category, is it targeting small business? Is it a game? What type of app is it? And as a function of looking at all of those variables, we are able to provide a fairly rigorous and, and very accurate estimate as to how a business is valued. And it's really exciting uh, because what actually happens, Kaushik, is we see so much data from these businesses coming in that are using the platform to sell. And we can then provide and pass that data on an anonymized and aggregated function to help people out with understanding how the business is performing. And so we see around 4,000 valuations a month. You are specific that it has to be revenue generating, right? Any specific reason for that? Mostly because then you can value the asset and it also provides some predictability and reliability to the buying customer. And so, you know, you could mount the case that you should be able to sell 
a app or a blog that has lots of traffic. The issue with that is how do you value it? Therefore, mm -hmm. you have some pricing credibility issues. And the other reason is most buyers are actually looking to acquire revenue. And they want to acquire revenue because for them, this is an investment. And okay. so the commercialization aspect of the business has already occurred. And therefore, you're buying something which is um, and for one of a better description, more trustworthy acquisition. Makes sense. For example, somebody who's building an app. So should I be going after the elephants or the deer? So in the sense that do I go after the large clients immediately, but probably running the risk that if one person backs out, then I'm again in a soup. Or should I rather go after maybe 10 SMB clients? So from a valuation perspective, which you recommend? So from a valuation standpoint, I would say that if you have a strong concentration of clients that are enterprise level, and they have a history of paying you over a long period of time. Enterprise is probably a more predictable revenue stream and less susceptible to churn. And as a function of that, you get some valuation benefit. If you're talking about the cold start problem and where you focus your energies on initially, selling to enterprise is hard because it's a long sales cycle. And it tends to be the decision maker involved in buying is harder to come by and it requires a more digging to understand who the paying customer is and so small business will typically be a quicker pathway to your first ten thousand dollars in revenue hundred thousand dollars in revenue or, or first ten or hundred clients so if you're talking about the cold start problem i think you're better off selling to a small medium business customer if you're talking about enterprise customers and the benefit of that in driving company valuation I would absolutely say that that's the way to go. How about between B2C and B2B? Any preference there? I think that as it relates to selling the company, once you've achieved scale and a predictable revenue stream, buyers will tend to reward you for that stage of your company. Again, if you're talking about the cold start problem, I think the hard thing about consumer-led companies is consumers are relatively fickle. It's very easy for us to make opinions and move from one supplier to another or from one online retail shop to another online retail shop or from one app to another app. Whereas a business customer tends to be, to use a very simple term, a little more sticky. And so B2B businesses are well rewarded. Thanks for the insight. This, of course, is not your first venture. I believe it was Good44, which was also a VC-backed uh, specialty food marketplace. So how did it go? Yeah, so, I mean, it certainly wasn't a successful Endeavor, Kaushik, I ran that business for five and a half years. And I guess like many, many startups, the intent and the ambition was good, but ultimately I never found product market fit. The target addressable market was too small. And as a marketplace selling specialty food, we had so many different variables that we needed to control. Obviously we had to acquire the suppliers and the merchants who were retailing the food, utilizing our platform. We had to then market to consumers who liked that food. And then we then needed to control the logistics end of the offering such that the food that was often perishable in nature arrived on time every time. And so I think that we probably bit off more than we could chew uh, for a business that was funded, but not well-funded. And as a function of that, that proved to be very difficult. Can you give us a little more about how you actually came into entrepreneurship? I think it all started... Um, with my move to San Francisco from Melbourne, Australia back in 2005. Initially, I was over there representing Lonely Planet and I was running their business development team. We were responsible for, for licensing and, and syndicating Lonely Planet's content to everyone from American Express, Expedia, Yahoo Travel to even, of course, the, the first Lonely Planet travel app on the iPhone. So that gave me an entry point to Silicon Valley and I met so many people who were working either at startups or great tech companies and to some extent, their enthusiasm for solving global problems tends to rub off on you. And I find, found my way at a venture back startup called Nile Guide. Uh, we'd raised 13 and a bit million dollars in the very early stages of the company. And we'd done that just prior to the global financial crisis in 2008. And as a function of that, we were well capitalized, but certainly building a business through those times was difficult. And the experience was wonderful. The learning being surrounded by so many good quality engineers, fantastic founders who were obviously taking on a big problem and being involved in a venture-based organization at a fairly young age was outstanding experience and certainly built some resiliency. 
but also gives you the itch. And from there, you want to do it yourself. You want to take on ambitious projects. And I think that's what's so great about that economy and that area of the world. You do tend to want to chase your dreams having been inspired by so many people around you who have already done so. I'd say that's where my appetite and excitement and enthusiasm for entrepreneurship was derived. You've been in so many VC-backed companies. I consult a few uh, startup founders as well, and I've heard quite a few of them, at least in India, going right out at the outset and saying, all I want to do is raise capital. So what do you have to say for these guys? Don't. (laughs) Exactly. My, My advice would be build the best possible business you can with the least amount of influence from third-party investors, certainly get influence from advisors, mentors, great staff members, and find talent that's willing to jump in the deep end and help you navigate your way through problems. But hold off until you have a real story that you can pitch confidently. And as a function of doing that, you'll tend to get a better valuation because you will have proven more. You'll be further down the product market fit path. And as a function of that, you'll be rewarded by not only the amount of money you can raise, but the capability and knowledge of the investors that you take on will be substantially different had you proven something versus finding those investors will back something where you haven't proven anything. What are the key traits that you feel is a must for any founder to begin his journey? Yes, I think passion is a massive part of of building a great business. Mm -hmm. You have to wake up every day. And given the emotional energy and sometimes toll that built running a, and building a, uh, a great business or a potential great business has, you tend to get energy from the passion you have for solving the problem or for the customer base that you represent. It's all good to have a huge amount of passion in the early days, but I think what sets apart the great founders or, or great CEOs is a long-term passion for investing more and more time into either solving a problem or building a great company. So that would be number one. The second one would be intellectual curiosity or creativity. So I think what's interesting about building great companies is that often best laid plans do not come to fruition. And so you need to have a natural curiosity that is both creative and data centric in its approach. And as a function of that, you need to be able to make decisions quickly and execute very, very swiftly. And I think intellectual curiosity tends to set good and and less good founders apart because they tend to be able to instigate change as a function of that natural curiosity. Some people are, I think, really good at recognizing a pathway forward. And they're really good at bringing to market features and ideas quickly. And I think that ultimately the thing that therefore um, sets people apart in addition to to passion and that intellectual curiosity is their ability to move at an insane pace. And certainly what we try to do here at Flipper is in representing business owners from around the world, our job is to find a pathway to exit as fast as we possibly can for those business owners. And that means building the products and the features that they need our platform to be able to get those deals done. So we tend to observe what they need and then build it extremely quickly to satisfy what they want. And Flipper, is it something that you're just focused on Australia market or it's across the world? No, Australia is quite insignificant for Flipper, actually. We base our product and engineering team here. I am based, but we have a sales and marketing office in Austin, Texas, in Amsterdam. And then we have people spread globally throughout the world. We have a user base of almost 2 million people spread across 193 countries. And in fact, the interesting thing about Flipper as a function of our AI matching, we see 67% of all deals across border, which you could never achieve in a traditional brokerage or M&A context. It's our ability to find a buyer anywhere in the world based on intense signals and match them up to a relevant business regardless of where they're based and provide that platform that connects those two and then gives them the tools to get those deals done. So no, it's truly global actually. And that creates all sorts of complexities because your legal documentation has to be jurisdiction agnostic. You need to have teams of smart brokers and M&A advisors 
strategically placed around the world to to satisfy the needs of what those business owners and buyers are attempting to do on the platform. Which brings me to my the next part of the question in the Americas or in Europe or Australia. Is there any primary mindset difference that you find between these regions? I think there's certain regions where their ambition is greater than others. But as it relates to a desire to to build a good quality business, which is satisfying a customer need or satisfying customer demand. I think the characteristics of one, being ambitious, being curious, and respecting that speed is a characteristic that tends to win, I would say that's common. The ambition across different regions is a function of the types of businesses that people take on and the size of business that they attempt to build. Whether they ultimately get there or not is a function, obviously, of the market that they're tackling and their ability to execute. And so we tend to find that American business owners aspire to build businesses and as a function of the market they operate in. On average, the businesses that we see exit out of the US are bigger than the businesses we see exit out of Australia, as an example. That's typically two things. One, it's a mindset difference. Americans aim to build bigger businesses than Australia. And then secondly, it's target addressable market. The average Australian builds a business for the Australian market, and there's fewer people you can sell to. And that doesn't matter whether it's a SaaS business, a blog, or an app. The reality is, in America, I get to build a bigger business by nature of having a bigger market that might be interested in the asset that I've created or the business I'm building. Very interesting. My final question is around the leadership front, because you've led a lot of teams, uh, led companies. So for example, you're handling a sales team and a tech team. So let's say one of the teams within that is slower than the other. I'm sure you're just like me. You would be one of those impatient people who want results quickly. And as they say, the chain is as strong as its weakest link. So how do you really handle this? I think there's a few things. The first thing is focus. So what is it that you want that department to achieve at any given time? And is that clearly understood? So if you can start from the perspective of this is our objective, here's how it's being measured. And here are the set of tasks which give us the best possible chance of achieving that objective. If you can get clarity around that, then you're starting from a good place. And different departments have a better feel for what they actually have to achieve and how it impacts the organization than others. And that comes down to leaders. It comes down to how often they actually talk about the business's problems and the customer base and how you're looking to satisfy them. And sometimes leaders do that better than others. The other way to think about it is, benchmarks. So we benchmark our product and engineering function through cycle time and and throughput. And so you can find global benchmarks and you can then measure that team against those benchmarks. And you can essentially see how fast you execute compared to how the rest of the market executes. And that's a really good way, not a perfect way, but it's a really good way to get a sense for is your team a high performance team or a low performance team. And of course, that spectrum is very broad, but that's a good way to start. Sales is a little bit harder because what you've got to figure out is what is the actual system that gives you a better chance of winning the client or converting the client that you're trying to win or convert. And that system is iterative because it's one thing to say, well, some person has done five deals, therefore they're better than the person who's done four deals. The question is how sustainable and long-term can one person perform versus another? And that'll often balance out as someone follows a system versus not. I'll have to make an exception and ask you a last question now. <laughs> How critical is, let's say, branding or creating that brand around the entire offering? Very. People define it in different ways. For me, it's about how your customers feel about you. And so if people have heard of us or experienced us, how do they describe Flip? That is brand. And you have to continue to work. And that is a function of, are you consistently and repeatedly telling people what it is that you offer, why it is that you are different and how you can support and service their need? And I would say that if you don't do that, you're highly unlikely to have long-term success. And then a good measure of brand and brand awareness is one, is your direct and organic traffic base growing? Is your referral traffic growing? And then are you consistently achieving a better net promoter score month on month, quarter on quarter, or year on year? And so brand is critical in building a long-term sustainable business. 
it may not be critical if you're trying to make as much money as possible over a six month period running a dropship business. That's a different story altogether. But if you're looking at building a long-term sustainable business where people want to work for you and customers want to buy from you, I would say brand is critical. Lovely. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Blake, for having taken the time out. Absolutely love the insights and wishing you the very best for Flipper as well. Thank you so much, Koshik. Appreciate your time.